Hi, everyone. This is America Adapts, the climate change podcast. Hey, adapters, welcome back to the podcast. In this episode, I'm hosting Dr. Ji Sung Park, an associate professor of public policy at UCLA. Ji Sung talks about how rising temperatures impact student academic performance and how the labor markets will also be negatively impacted. Basically, climate change can have real world consequences on the world's GDP, and it's likely to get worse. We also discuss adaptation options to mitigate against rising heat and how some of these options might actually make the climate situation worse. It's never easy, is it? Finding solutions to worldwide problems. It's a great conversation with a leading expert in adaptation economics. For some updates, upcoming episodes, I'm headed to Massachusetts and Martha's Vineyard to learn how a local environmental group is adapting the coastline to climate change. And I'm also headed to North Carolina to learn how the Research Triangle is ramping up their climate work. I'm also talking with Dr. Maxine Burkett of the University of Hawaii and discussing island migration and climate reparations. I love these conversations. I want to mention the work that I'm doing with Simpatico Studios. It's been a busy couple weeks. I have now recorded 11 pilot episodes with adaptation experts from around the world. Bangladesh, Denmark, Canada, Australia. It's really just been exciting. And I want to give you a bit more information about this. I'm hosting these live talk shows on Simpatico TV. Simpatico is a new software television company that produces live stream talk shows about important business and social problems, policies, and innovations. I will be anchoring appropriately the Climate Adaptation Channel, where I will interview academics, policymakers, journalists, researchers, and climate adaptation professionals just like yourself. Simpatico is an invite-only professional network, and I'd like to personally extend an invite to all adapters interested in joining a community of peers. Our television shows will be live streamed, meaning you can interact directly with me, my guests, and other community members in chat during our interviews. I'd also like to invite you, adapters, to join me as a guest on upcoming pilot episodes. If you have a specific problem, policy, best practice, product, or program that you'd like to highlight to your peers, we are ready for your debut on Simpatico. Videos from all episodes are professionally produced, and you can use them on your website and social channels like YouTube. I'm hearing more and more of you are checking it out, and I'm looking forward to learning more about what you do. These interviews have been great. It's connected me to a whole bunch of new networks, and there's some amazing work going on around the world. Let's hear your story. Also, if you're interested in sponsoring a specific podcast or having me speak at a public or corporate event, please reach out. I share stories from the podcast and my own experiences and adaptation. And if you're thinking of starting your own podcast, I'm doing a bit of podcast consulting. It's easier than you think, and it's much harder than you think. So reach out at the website. There's some email that you can reach me at. And don't forget to check out the Podcast in the Classroom initiative we're doing. I've heard from many professors using America Adapts in their classroom. Consider using it more formally with some discussion guides that have been developed for multiple episodes. You can find those discussion guides on my website at americadapts.org. Yes, it's a personal mission to get more professors and teachers using podcasts in the classroom. Your students will thank you for it. Okay, let's check in with Dr. Jason Park at UCLA. Hey, Adapters. Today, I have a very exciting episode. I'm talking with Dr. Jisung Park. Jisung is an assistant professor in the Department of Public Policy at UCLA. Hi, Jisung. Welcome to the podcast. Doug, thanks for having me. We connected a while ago, and we were kind of brainstorming on some topics to talk about, and we finally got around to doing this. And so, again, yeah, it was great connecting in the first place, but I'm really looking forward to kind of sharing the the research, and it's just some really important work. Well, I'm glad you think so. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, excited to talk about it. We're going to be talking about rising temperatures and their impact on the economy, but some other things, too. But first, what is your role at UCLA? Uh, you're relatively new there, but you're at this public policy office, but what, what do you do there? Sure. So I'm an assistant professor here. My training is as an economist. I specialize in environmental and labor economics, mostly the economics of climate change. But I teach in the Department of Public Policy, which is in the school, the Luskin School of Public Affairs. You can think, you know, a combination of economists, political scientists, sociologists, people who are interested in trying to use, you know, science and data to to try to help understand social issues and design policy. So I, I teach in this department and also you know, mo most of my time is, is at the moment on, on research, looking at issues that in some ways have to do with climate adaptation, which I know we're going to talk about. So how did you, I mean, you're relatively new to UCLA. How, yeah. how do you, I mean, were you from California? Why did you select UCLA? So 
you're gonna have to stop me if I get too autobiographical, Doug. People uh, like that where stuff. I'm, okay, well, where I'm from is kind of a loaded question. So my parents are from South Korea, so they they came to the U.S. as as grad students. Uh, I was actually born in Ohio and grew up in the Midwest. I grew up in uh, Lawrence, Kansas. I don't know if you've ever been there. Yeah. Home of the Jayhawks. Another reason why I'm I'm a huge basketball junkie. But then we moved to Korea. When I was nine, so lived there, lived in Seoul for five years, moved back to Kansas. Then I went to high school on the East Coast in Massachusetts, college in New York, and then spent some time in England, went back to the East Coast. So California is re- relatively new. That's a long winded way of saying I'm not from California. My wife is sort of from California, although she was born in Korea. These last sort of two and a half years have been a real, real sea change for us, and, and we love it out here. It's great. Boy, that is the most humble way of describing your, your history, especially your academic history that I've ever heard. You, oh. you, you left out some key details. Columbia, followed by right. Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship. Oh, my yeah. goodness. And then yeah. PhD at Harvard. So, yeah, you kind of sh- <laughs> glossed over those little details. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, that was quite a journey. It, it, it has been. And look, Doug, I, I don't want to spend too much time on that, but let's just say some of it is, is, is hard work for sure, but a lot of it is just an accumulation of, of luck and good breaks. And I'm, I'm very fortunate to have had those opportunities. And, uh, hopefully we can direct that human capital. We can talk about human capital on this podcast too, but direct it in a way that, uh, is useful to society. All right. So let's just jump into some of the work that you've done. And I, I kind of want to start it off with, and you gave me a, a bunch of material for homework and I do a lot of uh, research before. <laughs> and now this is great. Sorry. It's the professor thing. You know, I can't, I can't help. It. And I looked at most of it. I don't think I got through all the academic papers as quickly as I should have, but uh, that, you know, I, I actually love when people share more of the news media kinds of New York Times articles and those kind of things because sure, the, sure. those journals do a good job of framing what you're doing a bit better than an academic paper in, you know, more broadly. And so I want to start off that. There was a New York Times column by Nicholas Kristof, the oh, yeah. very famous you know, New York Times column that's been around for a long time. And then you, yeah. you were right there mentioned probably right at the top. He was talking about some of the work that you're doing. So could you explain what he was talking about? What, what was he highlighting there? Sure. So obviously can't do it as well as he did in the in the piece. But I think the main point is that you know climate change, we, we usually think about climate change in terms of, you know, melting ice sheets and and rising sea levels and hurricanes and maybe some crop failures here and there. You see a picture of an emaciated polar bear. He was trying to highlight some of the recent research, which is quite recent and and includes some of my own, that really tries to focus on what climate change might mean for just the everyday of, of human beings and specifically on how extreme heat or hot temperature affects just human performance on on a variety of things. I think in that particular piece, he was talking about my paper on New York City public schools and student performance. And I'd be happy to go into, you know, any or all of the details. But the basic finding there is that, you know, high school students taking this really important exam is called the New York City Regents exam. Think of it like an AP light. It's you need to grad, you need to pass a handful of these to to graduate from high school. And it turns out that after crunching, you know, four and a half million data points, I found that, you know, if you were unlucky enough to take this exam on on a hot day, say a 90 degree day, you were substantially less likely to pass that subject, which actually had a ripple effect in terms of the likelihood that you graduated from high school, at least for the median student, which, you know, we're talking underrepresented minorities who who aren't really who whose likelihood of going to college was quite low to begin with. And so. Nick did a great job in that piece of really just bringing more attention to this maybe underappreciated fact that the the direct impact of hot temperature on human beings, whether it's through cognitive effects or just physiological exhaustion uh, or something else, may actually be an important piece of the of the climate climate change puzzle. And this might seem obvious for folks, but this is New York City, but I'm sure you, this is something right. that could happen elsewhere. But uh, how does Absolutely. climate justice and climate equity play into this? How, what, what's the kind of the implications there? Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot we could unpack there, Doug. And, and by the way, you know, I'm sure you have this a lot with professors. You ask about their research. It's like it's like opening a Pandora's box. You can't shut it again. So if I keep if I go into too many details, just stop me. Um, but it's not just because it's also not just this this particular study. You know, we did a follow up 
with College Board and a co-author of, uh, of mine at Brandeis, Josh Goodman, looking at the entire U.S., so not just New York City. And it turns out, you know, this phenomenon of heat affecting students is quite pervasive, first of all. But to your point about racial and economic justice, you know, what we find, and maybe to teachers and, and some educators, this is not uh, that surprising, you know, how extreme heat affects students really seems to be dictated uh, in large part by who you are and where you live, right? It's not like we don't have the technical capability of protecting students from the heat. It's just that you know, black and brown people, low income students tend to go to schools that just don't have the resources or just haven't had the time to modernize their facilities. So for example, uh, in a recent paper, it's actually forthcoming this May in the American Economic Journal, we find that there's vast disparities in levels of school air conditioning by race and income within the United States, which is already one of the most highly air conditioned countries in the world. So we can talk about international implications later, if you like. But because of these disparities, we actually find that already climate change or just existing differences in climates may be uh, exacerbating racial achievement gaps. But we've known for a really long time that Educational attainment is a fundamental ladder to economic mobility and success, both in this country and elsewhere. We've also known for a really long time that African-American and Hispanic students tend to perform substantially worse on a variety of metrics of standardized performance. We use the PSAT, but you could have done this with the SAT, AP, whatever. Average gap in learning uh, approximately worth three years of, of formal schooling. There have been so many efforts at trying to close that gap, whether it's teacher training, Teach for America, you know, busing, you name it. And what we're finding is that climate change, uh, because of the way it differentially affects, adversely affects the learning and test taking of African-Americans, Hispanics, and just lower income students generally, it may actually be contributing to that gap in, in a pretty large way. I, I know we could easily go down some rabbit holes here, but this is very interesting. Yeah. And I, I wonder more internationally, it's sometimes it's apples and oranges, but how you can sure. kind of compare educational achievement, especially in, you know, more equatorial countries where it is yeah. warmer and there's, you know, developing countries not access to air conditioning at every school. Can you look at certain educational achievement and compare that to the U.S. and then piece out that climate fingerprint, what you're doing here? Have Are you doing that yet? Or is it even possible? Or are they just not kind of, oh, math achievement and it's just different? I mean, how could you do that? Yeah, so... I don't think we talked about this, right? Because you basically outlined the paper, the next paper that we're currently working on, which is about to come out hopefully soon. But the short answer is we can try to do that. There actually have, you know, the same way researchers have tried to understand uh, achievement gaps within the United States for decades. Researchers have also tried to understand achievement gaps across countries and try to quantify it in a comparable way, although it's very difficult, obviously, when you have so many linguistic and cultural differences. But, you know, the OECD has something called the PISA program, the program for, I think it's something like international standardized achievement. And the basic premise there is to try to develop a series of metrics that can give you a sense of, OK, like how does the average 14 year old's math attainment in France compare to that in Angola, compared to India, United States, et cetera. And had we done this podcast, had we recorded this podcast, maybe three to Four months from now, I, I would have been able to share the finalized findings from the research that we're doing, which is exactly that, to try to see if hotter temperature actually lowers the rate of educational attainment across countries. But let's just say the preliminary evidence suggests that that is a, a very uh, strong possibility. And so if you think about it, right, how many how many 90 degree days do we have in the U.S. on average? I mean, yeah, in a place like San Antonio, you get several dozens, but it's not that many relative to the rest of the world, right? I mean, in New Delhi, you get something like 150 such days at least per year. I don't know what the level of school AC is in India. It's definitely not 100%. It may not even be 20%. Right? And so if you want to speculate about where this kind of impact might be really acute, certainly we're worried about equatorial regions. But I guess if I could just add one last thing that... One of the intentions of the research that, that you know you asked about that Nick Christoph highlighted that was my PhD dissertation, it was to in addition to thinking about this these global consequences, also try to bring it a little closer to home. I don't think I'd be the first person to point out that when it comes to climate change, we have this tendency of of maybe making it too big picture 
and and it's sort of really easy to to think of it as you know this thing that is happening to other people over there whether over there is again you know india or bangladesh or or where have you i really wanted to to see if there was a way we could use the most rigorous methods and the biggest data possible to really paint a more nuanced picture of what climate change might be doing here closer to home in this case within the united states and how it might be affecting people at different rungs of the economic economic ladder so to speak differently right because you know Doug let's face it the the climate reality that you and i face on a day to day whether that was as a student or as a, as a an adult in the workforce very different from say 14 year old african american growing up in queens going to a school that is 100 years old you know hasn't upgraded its facilities in over 3 decades can barely afford to pay its teachers right so when you're in the gym taking an exam in late june it's 85 outside it might be 100 degrees inside you know you're already kind of on the margin of dropping out of high school right you fail this math test right that ha- that can have a ripple effect uh, on 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 that individual's life that you know people like you and me may not have ever had to think about and related to that you've been actually able to i guess create a contrast too you think of the southern united states the warmer versus yeah. the northern united states and there are i think the differences between educational achievement and you're, you're you're tracing it back to partly the temperature and what I thought was interesting too is that I'm from the South and pretty much every school in the South has. Oh, yeah. Where are you from in the South? Mainly grew up in Florida, but lived in Georgia for a while and so. Okay. I, you know how hot it gets. Okay. It, it's it's murderously hot, but most, if not all, have air conditioning. But just right. most people think, well, you know, now they have air conditioning, so there shouldn't be any differences. But you you've been able to sort of parse out differences in like it's it's it doesn't quite make up even if you have air conditioning schools because there's such things as like when you go home that sure. you're in different temperature regimes and it affects your body is that right is it it doesn't solve all your problems by just sticking ac in right i think that's right so let me just take a step back a couple of couple of broader points before i launch into ac first is by no means does this research try to suggest that everything is driven by temperature right i mean there are very big differences between the north and the south whether it's in terms of history or educational institutions, what have you, that, you know, probably play a really big role, a much larger role, frankly, than climate does. We just wanted to say, hey, look, maybe climate still is also a part of the problem because it hadn't ever been looked at it at that way. Um, and you're right. Hotter places in Atlanta, Florida, sorry, Georgia, Florida, Texas, where have you, tend to have more air conditioning, whether that's in school or at home, than, say, you know, the Northeast or even the upper Midwest or California. But we find that even within hotter places, it's not as though every school has complete air conditioning and that the likelihood that you go to a school in Houston or Orlando or Atlanta that doesn't have AC, or even if it does have AC, it doesn't have it working for all of the classrooms, seems to be much higher if you're a racial minority uh, or you're low income. I mean, the other part you mentioned is is also uh, access to cooling at home. Uh, We know that uh, access to air conditioning is a function, is driven by, uh, by differences in income and sometimes constraints in income. Uh, just because you have an AC doesn't mean you use it all the time. Some some people, unfortunately, at the bottom end of the income distribution may have to face a trade off between, you know, am I going to be delinquent in my bills this month because I ran the AC a lot, har- a lot harder than usual? Or am I just going to tough it out? That's a little bit of speculation on my part, but I don't I don't think it's a it's wild speculation. This equity issue, I find it interesting, especially the New York example. And I wonder yeah. if people are interested in research that backs up, you know, because with climate change, a lot of it's just projections. What happens 30, yeah, yeah. 50 years? You're looking at things right now. And if someone's taking a test and on a, at your study, it says, you know, they're not going to perform as well when there's these mm-hmm. higher temperature days. Uh, can they use – and I know you, you're an academic and you don't necessarily want to speculate on these things. But if I was a parent, I mean it seems like if you wanted to sue the school district for allowing the test to be taken on a hot – they know a hot day is coming. You should put it off. Could they use your research to sort of back up influencing right. this behavior? You know, It seems like you're there providing some quantitative data on on the impacts of 
t- testing during these when it's hotter. I mean, is, yeah. I mean, I guess you've always got that. Can't really control what people do with your research problem. <laughs> But that's not a bad thing. If it led to policy changes, you know, it's like we're going to be sensitive to to the weather. Of course, of course. So let me let me see if I can not over editorialize, but just so first of all, I think I'd love to if we have time, Doug. I'd love to talk about your take on this sort of balance between, for lack of better framing, negative and positive emotion when it comes to trying to solve climate change. Uh, I just have this gut sense that. We're a little out of balance on the negativity side of things. And of course, when when there is uh, equity to be redressed, obviously that is going to entail uh, some uh, some amount of, of confrontation. But I would also like to, to to make sure we're focusing on the on the solution side as well. So that being said, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> look, the there have been reports, whether in The New York Times, Washington Post, uh, just uh, among teachers unions of these kinds of conditions in classrooms affecting students. You know, teachers have been observing this and complaining about this for a while. And here's the challenge with something like temperature. It's really hard to convince someone that, well, what you observed was not just, was, was not just some anecdotal fluke, right? It's like, unless you have definitive data and you've run the analysis so that it's, you know, in the academic parlance, quasi-experimental or as close to an experimental setting as you can as you can get it that allows you to say X caused Y as opposed to merely correlations. You're sort of you're trying to argue something that someone can just say, well, are you sure that it was temperature that caused your son or daughter to perform worse? Right. I mean, how, how do we know that? And so one of the motivations behind the, the study and the reason why, you know, I. I spent as much time as it took to get this data, to, to, to build the relationship with the data providers and to, to, to go through the necessary steps to, to make sure we're, you know, using this big data and, and setting up the pieces in a really uh, rigorous way, uh, as many others in, in the applied economic literature are now doing, was so that we could provide as sort of robust an evidence base as possible so that, yeah, if, if this comes up in a, a parent teacher conference or someone is trying to to decide whether or not, you know, his or her local school should, in fact, fund a bond measure to improve AC. Now you have some data. Right. I hadn't quite thought about suing the schools for like not having changed the time of the exam. I mean, it's worth let's think about that. It's worth it's worth bearing in mind that these exams are usually very highly synchronized. And so it's not. If it's synchronized in, across the entire state, for example, you need to do a lot of coordination in advance to, to know uh, whether it's worth trying to reschedule. If not, every part of the state is going to be hot on, on exam day. An interesting finding was that in New York City, I actually found that teachers seem to be fudging the grades a little bit for students who are just on the pass fail margin. So basically giving them a little bit of a boost. If you say you need a score of 65 to pass, but it was a really hot day and you got a 63. They were sort of giving a little bit of, of extra credit here and there so that the, the test would, would pass and the student wouldn't fail because of it. And there are ways we can actually wow. show that. Climate inflation. I, uh, <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. But that, that to me, I, I can't know what the teachers were trying to do. But that's certainly consistent with this recognition that, oh, man, it's not fair for Johnny who, you know, came to class all the time and tried – really hard who just happened to take this exam on a really hot day i don't think it's fair that he should fail out of high school and have to retake 11th grade because of this i'm gonna if i have some discretion i'm gonna try to prevent that 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 at least seems to be one story that's consistent with the data and again you're you're doing this research but i just think about the real world implications and someone goes to a school board meeting holds up your paper and says this is after the fact that their child takes a test my son did poorly on this test because of climate change. <laughs> and if I understand your research right, there, there maybe not her individual case, but there is some truth to what she might be saying. And I just, yeah, it, it yeah. could ricochet uh, into policy decisions going forward, which, I, again, I think would ultimately be a good thing. The last time I checked, New York City, the, the de Blasio administration 
put quite a bit of resources, pledged quite a few resources to um, to improving school facilities and specifically air conditioning. So, hey, maybe, you know, if, if this and other research helps nudge us toward thinking about, you know, climate resilience in schools, that's great. I think that's great. I don't know enough about the legal world to know whether that kind of course, that that court hearing about, you know, retrospective student performance would hold up. But yeah, you better be careful. You're going to be called as an expert witness in some <laughs> civil educational case. I'll deal with that problem when, when we get there, I guess. And, you know, reading your stuff, it just got a lot of things flowing in my head, usually sort of worst case scenarios. But it, it got I just did an episode. Well, it's about about a year, but I did an urban forestry and adaptation episode in New York City. They took me uh-huh. around and just learned how the city and some of the groups up there are using urban force to mitigate yeah, yeah. and adapt to climate change. And it just reading your research, it, you the city could make an argument that, you know, investing in a strong, robust urban forest could actually improve educational achievement. Uh, yeah. That's kind of like how I read your paper. I'm like, that's no, another angle on urban forest. Yeah, and that's, a, that's another paper that I hope to write someday. I mean, uh, oh, to okay, test that great. hypothesis. Wow. Uh, it's a little hard harder to, to figure out how you do that. But the, absolutely, I mean, look, one thing I really want to stress about the research so far is that, okay, if we find that extreme heat affects students or it affects workers, et cetera, that doesn't necessarily mean that therefore air conditioned air conditioned the crap out of everything. That's not necessarily the implication. It's that, OK, let's think creatively and holistically about cooling. And to the extent that there are ways you can achieve that cooling without adding carbon emissions. Absolutely. And so I'm not an expert on the temperature effects of greening. But my read of that literature is that absolutely, if you have more urban tree canopy, uh, that cannot hurt. And there are other positive uh, spillovers that come from having more trees in, in a neighborhood. And so, uh, you know, that that's just like one of those great win win examples where you could potentially increase climate resilience and also a whole host of other health and, and psychological indicators. And it also just looks nice. Right. I mean, uh, New York City today looks a lot better just as a as a citizen walking around than than it did when I was in college. And part of that is because of all the trees. Okay, so I want to pivot a little bit. I want to, I guess, step back and look at this issue more broadly. And there, there's all sorts of things I want to talk about with you. But yeah. I guess you're going to have to clarify what research that you're currently doing. But some of the information that you share talk about the effects of climate change and specifically heat on the labor market, literally how productive yeah. are workers. And I, I got all these things in my head. I was thinking like the GDP and yeah, yeah. tying you know, a certain amount of temperature rise, will that – you know, lower the uh, gross domestic product. And if you want to sort of maybe define some of these terms, it might be helpful for some people. But sure. it, that if the temperature goes up, then the GDP could suffer because labor productivity goes down. And yeah, could you maybe just elaborate a little bit on what what you're seeing there? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So let's just get a couple of, let's say, stylized facts out there. One is there are over 1.1 billion people on this planet who work in agriculture, which is mostly outdoors. There's something like another 150 million people who work in construction and another 100 plus million who work in manufacturing, which typically doesn't have air conditioning. And so you add that all up, you think about, okay, you know, if hot temperature reduces human productivity, say 1% per degree Celsius, which is sort of on par with the magnitude uh, that I find in the student research and also we found, uh, sorry, researchers have been finding in other laboratory settings and other settings. You start to add that up, that could be pretty big, right? And GDP is just the sum total of the productive activities that people engage in across the economy. And a, the lion's share of that is driven by human labor inputs whether that's cognitive or physical. And so, yes, uh, I've been interested for a very long time in trying to quantify the economic impacts of climate change or the implications, whether it's at the macro level uh, of GDP or more micro in terms of individual workers. And yeah, a, a, an important sort of piece of context there is that, you know, the way we as a research community have been thinking about and the policy community have been trying to quantify climate damages hasn't historically included this possibility. Uh, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with like the social cost of carbon. I don't want to 
on the lecture too much. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. very briefly, I'm sure some are familiar, but sure, sure. It's like you if you add up all of the bad things that climate change does, put a dollar value on them, right, and and sum that up over the entire world and all future generations, and discount it back to the present, and and divide it by the number of tons of CO2. That's the social cost of carbon. It's like the economist's attempt at trying to put a number on how bad climate change is going to be for society. That's the social cost of carbon, right? And there are many dozens, if not hundreds, of, of researchers and climate modelers and economists teaming up to try to, to to get a good estimate of that number. And that number is important because that informs how, from a cost-benefit standpoint, how serious we want to get in terms of reducing carbon emissions, right? Do we do we just want to put a carbon tax of $50 a ton, or should it be $500 a ton, or should you know we be go so f- go to the extreme of revolution against capitalism in quotes right and so so how how bad of a problem is climate change that's the social cost of carbon uh, almost all of the numbers that are out there in terms of the social cost of carbon at the moment do not include possible labor productivity impacts at least not that I'm aware and so yeah it um, I'm interested in in trying to see whether that's a thing and, and we're actively at UCLA we're, we're actively engaging some of that research well what kind of comes to m- my mind and you know I recently had some people on from the Federal Reserve Bank you know the, oh, right. the, yeah. primary driver in the US economy and the world economy and when you think about the implications of let's say he, rising heat will impact la- labor productivity to such a degree that you might knock a point off the annual GDP I mean real significant yeah, impacts yeah, yeah. you think they would be all over it. And, you know, the Fed is starting to think more about it. But are you hearing more of these conversations? And I guess you are, but it just – that's a pretty big deal. Most of the time yeah. on environmental causes, it's you, you, there's big players in the economy who just kind of ignore these kind of things. But here, the implication of this work is sort of saying this could have massive implications for the world's economy. Are people on it? You know, the World Bank. And I'm just thinking – don't they want to prevent this kind of impact on the, uh, the the world's growth? Yeah, Doug. I mean, spot on. And the answer is yes, they're on it. You know, okay. we could argue we could argue about whether they should have been on it sooner, or, you know, earlier or 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 not. But yeah, I mean, I'm really encouraged by you know, just last fall, the San Francisco Fed held its first ever Economics of Climate Change conference. I was supposed to go to that. I, I couldn't because of health reasons. But that's a really encouraging sign. I mean, the World Bank, you know, I had the opportunity to work with the World Bank as an independent consultant several years ago when they did, I believe it was the first, you know, climate change and poverty conference where there was an entire session on on heat and productivity. So we're getting there. Well, you know, <laughs> ideas diffuse Slowly. Right. People change their minds slowly. I mean, what is it that there's like that meme of the three stages of scientific discovery? It's like at first, you know, uh, the reaction to an idea is that can't possibly be true. And then second, the second stage is something like, OK, that's plausible, but not that important. And then eventually it's like, oh, yeah, that's obvious. That was always obvious. And I feel like when it comes to the effects of temperature on on the economy or human behavior and how that relates to climate change. We're sort of living through the the second to third step right now. I remember when I was a grad student, just starting grad school, the first really groundbreaking research papers on how temperature fluctuations could, in fact, whether they could, in fact, explain macroeconomic fluctuations in GDP uh, this was work by Melissa Dell, Ben Joan, Ben Elkin, and uh, a guy named Sol Shang, who's now at Berkeley. I still remember when those papers first came out, you know, you'd hear uh, like radio programs trying to cover it. And, and the basic the tone was sort of, yeah, but that can't possibly be true, can it? It was sort of, really, are you saying that a one degree Celsius hotter than average year across the world reduces GDP growth? Uh, on the order of a small recession for poor countries, like that can't be true. And I think, not to over paraphrase, but over the last 10 years, the wave of research that has come out since then seems to confirm that yeah, it could be true. It, it's 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 certainly not crazy to think that temperature affects 
a whole host of human activities and that if you add it all up, it could really affect macroeconomic growth. And, and, and really what I want to stress is that it, it can affect the distribution of economic opportunity, right? Even if you don't find a huge effect on aggregate, it's, it's getting back to like, you know, the kids who don't have AC versus the vast majority of kids in Atlanta who do, right? It's that, heter- it's that, what we call heterogeneity, that the disparities in the effect that I think, um, we should be paying more attention to. And related to that, and you, I think you alluded to it just a little bit, but you think about one of the primary solutions to this temperature issue, especially in schools, but even when people are working, yeah. uh, it's uh, sort of the, the knee-jerk reaction, let's just create more air conditioning in buildings right. or whatever. And I want you to kind of speculate here, too, is that I think of broad areas of the world that are going to need a lot more air conditioning so much that the energy footprint of that is going to be massive so massive that you could probably track it at a global scale and we're not going to provide that energy using renewable um, sources anytime soon and so okay i'm getting to my question here is that you have this massive new um, demand for energy that's going to lead to all these carbon emissions and then that's going to raise the temperature and they're getting pretty good at quantifying x amount of carbon emissions leads to you know this little bit of warming sure then that next level is that well with all that ac that came online that's going to uh, impact the temperatures even more well yeah but temperatures even more things temperatures go up even more and then the gdp is going to suffer a bit more because of labor productivity and i'm making a lot of leaps here but my point is like it's like two steps forward one step back Especially if you just look at the AC issue. Yeah. How do you kind of plan for the, the economics of that? Cause it's just going to make things warmer in response to things being warmer. And, um, it's just this feedback loop. Right. It's like, aren't we trying to solve the problem using the cause of the problem to begin with? Look, Doug, I, I, I that's a great question. And really quickly, I, I, I still remember one of the first times I presented this research is actually at the World Bank. There was a senior senior researcher who sort of at the end of the seminar asked exactly this question. And she's quite upset with me. She was like, wait, are you saying that we need to give air conditioning to everyone in Brazil and India and China? You know, can you imagine what that would do to carbon emissions and then to, you know, warming feedback? And it really gave me pause. I really had to think about, you know, what what are the implications and. Here's where I'm at. And I'd love, you know, please feel free to, to push back or, or give me your thoughts because it's still a working hypothesis. But the first thing is the evidence suggests that we need to find creative ways to cool. That doesn't necessarily mean it has to be AC. We talked about planting trees, but I know there are many architectural and urban design professionals who uh, are coming up with really creative ways to design buildings that are cooler, have better ventilation, utilize natural properties better to uh, to cool efficiently so that's one uh, and i and i feel like most of the emphasis on sustainable buildings quote unquote has been on reducing the energy footprint but it but i don't know whether there's been a focus on well quantifying what the health and productivity benefits of having incrementally better cooling right uh, architectural designs might be so so one is there may be better ways to cool than ac but suppose that air conditioning is the, is the main thing, and it probably will be. Uh, we're already seeing like, gigantic leaps in air conditioning demand in China and India, both as the planet warms, but more importantly, as incomes rise. You know, the technology S-curve really bites here as, as people get richer and want to, want, to, want to have AC. But I just I think it's worth noting that that's all the more reason why we need to stop thinking about this as mitigation or adaptation. And to really think of it as mitigation and adaptation, what I mean by that is had we been – there's nothing about air conditioning per se that adds the greenhouse gas emissions if the electricity comes from a carbon neutral grid, right? I know it's a leap, but imagine that all the electricity in the United States came from renewables or, or, or non-fossil fuel sources. Then you can have all the AC you want, not a problem, right? And so that's sort of yet another push for – for aggressive mitigation uh, as a premise. But I guess what I'd say is, two, you said two steps forward, one step back. Yes, but if the two steps forward involves saving 
lives or preventing a lifetime's worth of of adverse economic ripple effects, especially for the the bottom end of the of the income distribution, whose contribution to the climate change problem has been relatively minimal. I feel like the fact that we haven't acted on mitigation should not be an excuse for us to to think clairvoyantly about how we're going to help people adapt to extreme. That's a lot of a lot of of speculation in there, but. Well, and I, I get it. And I, you know, I agree with you. And I think most policymakers would agree with you. It's like, you know, you're thinking about people's well-being today, but you also have to sort of think what's baked in in the future. If you accept that sort of higher emission level, what sort of misery are you guaranteeing? Because you think I you're see. helping people today. And, and again, that's an important point. Can, yeah. can I just add yeah. something real quick? Sure, sure. The first the first thing to note is, again, and, and not to be too much of an economist here. If we've corrected the carbon market failure, the climate change market failure, by putting a price on carbon, the amount of AC that the market decides to add in that world shouldn't be a problem. That's one. Now, of course, we live in a world where we don't have the ideal social cost of carbon, price on carbon, and the politics of a carbon tax or a cap and trade are, are murky at best. I get that. But just that's if you want to talk big picture, if we have the right price signals in place, if we have the right price of carbon in place, what individuals decide to add in terms of air conditioning, that shouldn't affect the long term because that should be priced in. The second point is I think there is some miscon- there are some misconceptions about what percentage of total emissions come from air conditioning. I wish I had the numbers. Uh, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I know there's a professor at UC Berkeley, Lucas Davis, and his team have done some really, really cool work on trying to quantify uh, AC related electricity demand. And they find that it's, it's not trivial by any means. It's certainly, uh, not trivial, but it's also not like 50%, right, of, of global emissions. So just to keep, you know, some perspective on, on where all that comes from. And then finally, if you really want to talk big picture, I don't know if there's ever been a concerted policy push to try to create, uh, innovative solutions for low, low energy, high efficiency, sorry, high energy efficiency, air conditioning technologies or cooling technologies. And, you know, you can even talk about like cooling vests, for example. I don't know if we've had that push yet. And so you know, that if we had our pick of big picture policies, I think there's a world where you can save, you can, you can alleviate quite a bit of suffering over the next 30 to 40 years while also not, not really posing too much of a problem for long-term warming. Does, does that make sense, Doug? It, it does. And I just think I'm trying to remember dusting off my own environmental economics back under my undergrad, but just the, the notion of the textbook that you're using as a doorstopper. <laughs> right. no, I enjoyed that class. But the, the notion that when we start to use more AC to solve this problem and then people find ways, and especially let's say it makes more efficient. We have really, we can produce more, like as much AC with less energy, but then well, I don't even know what the economic term is, but then we just, and I think they, they use cars fuel efficiency as a good example of this, oh, but then the you end up, dr- you drive more because you got, and yeah. then all of a sudden the, the net use of carbon still has gone up, even though everything's more efficient. And I think of some of those places in the Middle East, they're like air conditioning whole outdoor plazas. Yeah, and, I mean, that's a little absurd. But not, it's absurd, but I'm saying as more people think of AC as this true adaptation and response, maybe that's the direction they go. And yeah, that would be problematic because all of a sudden we thought we were getting these efficiencies in, in using AC and then it just makes them, it kind of grows out of control. So yeah, but let me just, again, I don't want to be too much of a stickler on this point, but I, I want the, I want your listeners to, to really grasp this. If we have the right price on carbon, whether that's through a cap and trade system or a carbon tax or some hybrid that, you know, has has ways to re- recycle the revenue so that lower income populations are not hurt. If that is in place, what you just described should not be a huge problem because it should have been designed in such a way that the price signals mean that people aren't right. Either the electricity is going to be mostly from renewables so that you can air condition everything you want. And that will not necessarily add to greenhouse gas emissions or the price of electricity will be sufficiently high that it will not make sense to, you know, create a artificial ski rink 
or sorry, uh, what is it, ski slope in the desert, right. <laughs> right? And so really the challenge of policymakers is just to su- build support systems for low-income households who do really need air conditioning for basic necessities, like not dying during a heat wave, right, or being able to go to sleep before the night of a really important exam, right? Like that kind of cash transfer or, or AC sort of assistance subsidization program, that can, that, that can go a long way toward helping ad- adaptation without having to worry too much about these runaway air conditioning causing, you know, incrementally more warming scenarios. At least that's my view, but uh, that's, 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 that's admittedly speculative. So I want to really pivot strongly here and talk about adaptation in an academic s- setting. And you're at UCLA, UCLA now. And so how is UCLA approaching training prof- people to be professionals in the field of adaptation? It's a great question. So let me just start by what, what I'm most familiar with, which is on the research and policy side. You know, we're, we're just in, I guess, a couple of months in May, we'll be hosting the first, uh, which, well, First of all, we hope to be a series of, of research symposia on climate adaptation. Uh, so it, it's on May 8th. Uh, hopefully you can put a link on your website or something. For sure, yeah. Um, but the idea here is to have uh, a gathering of minds uh, across disciplines to discuss cutting-edge research that can, that can help, uh, as you were mentioning before, set the big picture – uh, direction and strategy for adaptation, given given all of the concerns that we've talked about here and and you've talked about on other episodes on your podcast. So we're really trying to lead to 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 help uh, generate more conversation on on the on the research front, but we're also trying to to design it in such a way that it can plug in um, as seamlessly as possible, although that's uh, aspirational. Uh, with with the policy community, you know, right now we're at the Luskin School and the Luskin Center, for example, we're actively working with the California state government, um, whether it's the Division of Labor or the Strategic Growth Council or Cal OSHA, to see how research can be used to help better target adaptation policies that already exist, or help design new adaptation policies that should exist. So that's that's a real point of emphasis for us. Uh, you asked about training, though. Or go ahead. Well, I was just gonna, you know, and, and this is what I'm finding too. I have this conversation about how universities are are bringing um, adaptation, and what the model really seems to be is that you have professors like you just doing cutting edge research. You know, you bring in graduate students just to help with that. But how, how's it? And I, maybe UCLA isn't just taking this approach, but is it filtering down in the sense of like programmatic work or coursework? Is it, I mean, oh, you, I you, you can identify research, I'm sure pretty easily uh, where you want to go, but is there more, is it being baked into to the school? Yeah. And the, and the answer there is yes. Although baby steps, right? Let's be honest. I think I remember when I was an undergrad at Columbia, which was one of the, the leading sort of institutions when it came to environmental policy, sustainable development. Uh, and there was like one class on environmental economics. And there certainly was not a class on climate adaptation. And that wasn't that long ago. We're trying to build that kind of curriculum. Absolutely. I mean, you know, in my uh, graduate seminar, we try to talk about climate adaptation, both from the research angle, but also in terms of uh, applied policy in everyday life. You know, this school has, uh, I'm in the Department of Public Policy, but we sit right next to, we're in the same building as people in urban planning and social welfare. Uh, and so, yeah, the, the, the goal would be for these kinds of conversations to also trickle down into, or trickle down is the wrong word, but diffuse into uh, more on the ground, you know, city and regional planning or or even just, you know, dealing with the psychological or health consequences of climate change uh, more proactively. That's the hope. But, you know, we got to start somewhere, right? Right, right. And I encourage you to do it because you think about how students go around picking it. Let's say even a, a graduate school, they're like, oh, I want to get it wildlife management. And they there's these programs there. And right now it's still kind of a challenge. They have to hear about individual work being done by a professor. Yeah, yeah. And you might have some grant money that you can bring in a graduate student, but it's it's you're 
a lot of universities are really missing out because they're not offering these programs. And, you know, the programs need to be designed to, cause you're going to fill it with classwork. You know, it's like, right. what, what does it mean to have an adaptation masters or a PhD? That still remains to be seen, but I hope programs like yours are kind of figuring it, that out. That's five, 10 years from now, we're going to start seeing more of this. I appreciate that. Doug. Can I ask you a question on that front though? Because it, this is relevant. I think you might be in a privileged position to answer this. What kinds of jobs do you think these kinds of programs should be training students for? Because you, like, you, you have your ear to the adaptation grindstone, so to speak. So like what, what are the jobs that people are trying to fill that uh, are relevant to adaptation that students, you know, could, could aspire toward if there were a, a master's program that focused on that? Does that make sense? It, it does. And I think people are kind of struggling with this. I don't know if you're familiar with some of the professional associations and there's a, a adaptation uh, ASAP that should you get certified in adaptation. And if you do, what does that mean? You know, and what I'm discovering, which has just been an amazing journey for me, is my background's wildlife conservation, but mm-hmm. adaptation covers everything. You know, you're an engineer doing infrastructure work. You are an adaptation professional, depending on what you're working on. Sure. Landscape architects are just like in the thick of this, of like the having those skill sets. So I think different. I see. Different professions are going to need different adaptation background. But like, let's say in your public policy school, someone there's an adaptation track that you're offering. Then you just what is the coursework that you would mm-hmm. design for your students to take and. I just uh, my next episode is uh, Dr. Solani um, Vajhala from Refocus Partners. I don't know if you ever heard of him. They do a lot of infrastructure, but we were yeah. talking about so many people in the adaptation space right now are, are generalists. I would call myself that in a heartbeat. My background's in ecology, but I got into this adaptation space. But the next generation of people, they actually have specific skills that they learned, you know, in trade schools or if they're yeah. studying at schools like yours. And it's going to be different. It's no longer, oh, I was the sustainability officer at my company. I can do adaptation. It's going to be a bit more sophisticated. I hope right, that's how right. it evolves. But a lot right. of generalists are in the space right now. Okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, then presumably, you know, part of that coursework should involve helping people who have other specialized skills, whether it's in engineering or in public health or urban design to then be able to think about both the bigger picture science and the policy sort of and the economic kind of dimensions of climate adaptation so that they can apply those skills specifically to the needs that will arise because of climate change that that i mean that's just us brainstorming but well it and sounds plausible to me what if you get a, a degree in architecture but then you you minor in adaptation planning in whatever sure. like form that might take at that particular university but i think some of the schools in canada are f- farther along and just from my conversation oh, yeah. with the people up there and so i i Again, the U.S. is it's it's interesting model. There's people like you that are just cutting edge work, but then when it gets down to programmatic and coursework, there's barely anything there, you know. Hmm. So, well, there you go. What work to do? <laughs> you, Not you enough gotta, hours in the day, Doug. Not you, enough hours in the day. Well, when you go to your next staff meeting with the the dean of your school, it's like, all right, <laughs> get on it, okay. <laughs> Here's a question I want to ask about some of the policy implications of your, the work you're doing, and I think this is yeah. very interesting, is um, what is the California Outdoor Heat Illness Prevention Standard? How, what's your involvement? What's that all about? Sure. So, you know, we were talking about the potential impacts of heat on workers, right? One of So we could, it could affect productivity, obviously, but it could also affect worker health and safety risk. And so the California Heat, heat Illness Prevention Standard is – one of only a couple of mandatory state level regulations that try to, in effect, prevent heat related health and safety problems. And a little bit of context, there are no federally binding regulations with regard to working in, in outdoor uh, or, or any space that could be subject to temperature stress. And I believe in 2006, California became the first state to uh, implement this. And so the way the way it relates to the research, you know, we're currently teaming up with agencies in the California state government to try to really understand what is the relationship between temperature and and workplace safety risk. And here the important piece is, you know, uh, most of the studies so far and the policy work so far will focus on 
things that are very clearly attributable to heat. Kind of getting back to our question of like, you know, did did temperature actually cause the student to do worse? It's actually quite difficult retrospectively for someone who's doing a workers' compensation case, for example, to definitively say that, oh, yeah, this person died of a heart attack because it was so hot that day. And many times that case would just be noted as died of heart attack and not related to heat at all. But what we're finding in in preliminary work, hopefully will be available to the public soon, is that it's not just the, the cases that are heat illnesses or fainting due to heat, heat syncope, et cetera. It's actually a much broader range of injuries, you know, falling off of a ladder, being hit by a moving vehicle, spilling a really toxic substance on your on your foot, that these types of of injuries seem to to spike on really hot days as well. And so we're really trying to understand, well, how big of a problem is this? Does this affect how the state quantifies the risk of climate change for outdoor workers? But then also we're trying to see whether um, policy has a role to play in preventing that. There is a world in which policy action can really help both workers and firms, but there's, there also is a world where the policy, if not designed properly, can actually end up having unintended negative consequences too. So we're really trying to we're trying to do a rigorous evaluation of whether that particular policy worked and also what the implications are, if any, for federal and international regulation. I mean, last summer was the first time ever that Congress at least discussed in committee hearings a bill, a, a potential federal bill to um, address increased heat related workplace safety risk at the federal level. And I, I anticipate that, you know, there will be growing attention to this topic because the world is getting hotter by the year and, and a surprisingly large number uh, of people, as I mentioned earlier, uh, work, in, work in sectors and jobs that expose them to heat. And so, yeah, that's, that's the policy and the research. It'll be interesting as other states take up their own and how, well, how we can compare like, oh, this is not a very rigorous one. This is more rigorous and why, what's relevant to a particular state. But yeah, those things are coming. Yeah. And if I could just end with one, one note of, of caution, I mean, what we don't, what we do want is to see if there are ways policy can help workers, particularly those who may have limited bargaining power, make sure that they're not exposed to undue safety risk in a warming world. What we all, what we don't want is for the policy that was intended to help these workers to actually lead to some, to higher risk of, of unemployment because it accelerates automation, for example. And so just really trying to think carefully about what the optimal policy design and, and mix of, 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 of regulation versus other solutions is something that we're actively thinking about uh, at UCLA. It's always exciting for me to talk with a fellow podcaster. You were a podcaster, right? Oh, dabbled in it experimentally in grad school. <laughs> come, come on, tell me. What, what was the, the name of it, and is it still available? It's called Sense and Sustainability, like the Jane Austen novel. Nice. Uh, and uh, it is still available. It was just, you know, I think a master's student in, in Oxford uh, just getting excited about that was right when the podcasting sort of craze was starting up. And yeah, we, we had we had a, a series of episodes on, on sustainable development, broadly construed. It was a it was a fun foray. <laughs> well, good. You're a fellow podcaster. And OK, I didn't quite get the. Are, are you teaching classes at the moment? Are you a, a, like a yes. teaching? OK. And uh, are you using podcasts in the classroom? Is it a resource that you uh, uh, sign? Yeah, actually, yes. So I teach in the master's program and the undergrad program, and in both, at least a handful of times, I've assigned podcast episodes. Yeah. Okay. All right. You know, um, Jesse Keenan, he he assigns my podcast quite frequently, and I think oh, they get sorry. they get extra credit. I think if they listen and they kind of report back out on it. So I'm it's trying a cool medium, right? I mean, it, you can get into more depth than, and maybe more candor than uh, a written piece can. I found. So. Well, right. Well, I mean, I think professors have different like curricula that they set up, but like you've got sure. key readings, key papers, but then like you should have. And I, I remember on Twitter, Catherine Hayhoe, I mean, you know, the climate scientist, yeah. she was asking advice about what should you should include in her curricula. And I'd say, do you ever use podcasts? And she's like, no, I've never thought of that. It's a great idea. And she's been on a million podcasts, but she's never <laughs> thought about it. And she, 
you can get some substantive information and your students are going to love you for it because as opposed to reading some dry 50 page paper. So, <laughs> yeah, already on it, Doug. All but right. <laughs> maybe, but maybe you can give me some uh, some tips on which which episodes uh, of yours, you know, I should assign. Well, this one, I think at the start of your each your your class is going forward, you should be assigning this episode when it comes out. So just keep that in mind, too. I already assign enough of my own papers. I don't want to hear your voice anymore. Right. (laughs) All right. So two final questions here. And this is a relatively new question. Who's been a a major inspiration for you in the adaptation space? Who's sort of been inspired you specifically in this area? Oh, man. Oh, good question. So. Can I, if I may, there's so many. But one, 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 <laughs> and one. One is tough. We gotta get at least give me like three. Oh, it's, uh, it's, come on! All right. Well, do they truly rise to the top? That's the challenge. Is you're picking one. You know, I know there's influential people all in your life, but like someone that really rose to the top. That's why that's so special. You're picking that one person. It's tough. I mean, I, I gotta go personal. Then you know, I have to. I have to say. You know, Jeffrey Heal, who was my undergraduate senior thesis advisor, uh, he's an environmental economist at Columbia. He was sort of one of the first people who who believed in this, you know, upstart undergrad who wanted to work on climate change. And his work isn't about adaptation per se, but just using economics as a lens to to view environmental issues through. He was the really the first one of the first people who who. Who touched me in that way? I mean, okay, fine. I don't know <laughs> Stop there. But there's so many people, you know. I mean, and actually, I just, I'll, I'll cheat a little bit, and I have to say, a lot of my inspiration actually comes from outside of the, let's call it the typical climate change community, but from people like Larry Katz and Ross Chetty. Uh, they're uh, they're actually labor slash public economists at Harvard, who think a lot about poverty alleviation and and economic mobility. Uh, and what the barriers are that individuals and households at the lower end of the income distribution face and their work and their their approach, their really big data causal inference driven approach to research has been really inspiring for me because I've noticed there's so many parallels in thinking about who will or will not be able to adapt to climate change, uh, where you can draw a lot of insight from the already existing literature on poverty alleviation and, and income inequality. And so there, there may be a surprising source of inspiration. Okay. And final question. And, you know, th- with this inspiration question, my listeners, because they've heard it enough now, they're like, Doug gets steamrolled every single time, even when he tries to control it. So don't worry. <laughs> you, you, it's par for the course. Last question I ask everyone is, and it's similar, who would you recommend to come on the podcast and talk with me? Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Again, so many people. That's tough. I mean, if you want to talk air conditioning, <laughs> Lucas Davis at Berkeley, again, their their whole team does some really cool work if, to, to talk about the issues. Uh, Marshall Burke at Stanford does some great work. Sol Shang at Berkeley does amazing work. Uh, Michael Greenstone at U Chicago is is really trying to incorporate adaptation into social cost of carbon, uh, along with Sol and others in really cool ways. I've given you too many. Right, names yeah, right, yeah, I, that right there. Um, you know, actually, my listeners, I've heard, you know, they looked some of these people up, and so it's good. That's why I asked the question. Okay, Ji Sung, this has been an awesome conversation. Obviously, we've just scratched the surface. I'm hoping that you know I'll, I'll be able to have you back on because this will be an ongoing conversation. But yeah, thanks for coming on. No, thank you, Doug, and and thanks for providing this this public good on this issue. Thanks. Okay, Adapters, that is a wrap. Thanks to Jisung for coming on the podcast. I love these conversations. I learned so much. Jisung is really laying out some practical research that obviously is going to have some real-world implications. The impact on student achievement, this will only likely increase in importance as we learn more about the impacts of rising heat. And it sounds like we just can't air condition our way out of this problem. Also, as the impacts of climate change really start to affect the labor markets, we're likely going to see more interest from larger and larger players in the economy that want to find solutions. Well, that is the hope. I plan to have Jason back on. He'll continue doing some interesting and very important research, and I want to share those stories. Okay, don't forget to check out the Simpatico Studios link in my show notes. 
And don't forget, America Adapts is a charitable organization. Please consider donating if you're looking for climate organization to donate to. Thanks to all those who have become recurring donors. Some final housekeeping. Don't forget to join the Facebook page and the Facebook community group. The group is private, but just search for America Dabs and ask to join and I'll prove you right away. It's a chance to hear insider info on the podcast and to see what others are sharing on the wall. I've had some great conversations come out of that and people share when they go to other conferences and we have some conversations around those things. And so, yeah, check it out. On that note, I love hearing from you. I mean it. Just say hi. If you have an idea for a guest, let me know. If you want to brainstorm about an activity, let me know. Seriously, it's the highlight of my week hearing from you, and sometimes it leads to really cool things. I'm at americadaps at gmail.com. Send me an email. Check out the website at americadaps.org. Okay, adapters, keep up the great work. I'll see you next time.